Welcome to The Rich Outdoors, where we break down the tips, tactics, and strategies of hunting's greats. Not only help you become better hunters, but to motivate and inspire you between hunting adventures. For more about us, including additional resources on our guests and links to everything we cover in the interview, check out therichoutdoors.net. Hey guys, welcome to episode two of the Rich Outdoors podcast. Today, we're going to be chatting with Tim Burnett of Solo Hunters TV. Now, if you haven't seen the show, I highly recommend it. Solo Hunters is a show that Tim started, and it's definitely a different type of hunting show than we're used to seeing. Solo Hunters TV does a great job of capturing the reality of the hunt, and it's a hunting show much like how we all hunt anyway. So stay tuned as we chat about how Solo Hunter TV came to be, how hunting solo changes how we operate, and what gear helps Tim be successful. So on with the interview. Hey Tim, welcome to the Rich Outdoors. You uh, you've been busy lately, man. This time of year is crazy. <laughs> well, I'll, a whole time of year is crazy, but right now it's a lot of stuff going on. It's keeping me keeping me up, and that's for sure. Uh, for those of us who don't know everything about you and and haven't been watching Solo Hunter, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and Solo Hunter and everything you're doing over there? And. Um, Really not not exactly sure. I mean, I'm from central Idaho originally. Live here in Reno because this is where my wife's from. And it just worked out well after meeting Remy that he happens to be from, you know, 10 minutes away from where I live here. But just, uh, you know, typical regular hunting guy. I grew up hunting and uh, was, you know, learned to hunt just like everyone else and doing public So when did land. you start hunting? Just as a kid or what? Yeah, I started when I was 12. I mean, my dad didn't hunt, um, so it was more just my brothers and I kind of getting to know some friends, and then there was a retired military guy who moved into our town when uh, when I was 12, and he was just an avid bow hunter, and he was into traditional stuff, so he had you know, arrow-making equipment, and he made his own bows, and my dad was installing carpet in his basement one day, and we all went over there and were just enamored by all the arrow-making stuff. And he had this just wall of uh, VHS library full of hunting videos that were like Wayne Carlton, Dwight Show, um, Larry D. Jones. I mean, there was some Ben Pearson stuff, a bunch of Fred Bear stuff. And so we just started watching those videos and just became blown away. And ever since then, I was just hooked on archery. <laughs> Actually, I, when so, I got started, uh, one of my only hunting videos I had as a kid was a Wayne Carlton video. And I probably watched that a hundred times as well. And then it, it slowly came into Larry Jones and those guys. But yeah. Uh, so those are probably some of your early influences then, huh? Yeah, I remember when I first met those guys. Actually, Wayne and Larry were talking together, and I was just, like, so blown away. Uh, you know, hey, Mr. Carlton, how are you? And then, uh, you know, when I was 14, some friends of mine, we went with our scout troop down to uh, Utah. I went to a trade show, and we got Jim Zumbo's autograph and uh, Chuck Adams and stuff. And so it was just, like, really early on, I told my brothers, or I was like, when I grow up and get big, I'm going to make hunting videos. That's what I want to do when I'm, I grow up. Everybody's like, ah, whatever. Yeah, hey, well, congratulations. I guess, uh, you know, if you work at it and you keep your mind to it, you can do anything you want, right? Well, it turns out I still don't make hunting videos for a living, but uh, <laughs> it's a major part of my business anyway. So when did uh, when did everything turn into kind of solo hunting or and did you always, were you always a solo hunter? Or was that kind of something that developed over your hunting career? Well, no, growing up, like in high school and everything, it was it was me and my younger brothers and my my buddies. We were always out hunting together, and so I really didn't hunt alone then. But kind of growing up, um, you know, I don't know why. I was kind of a little bit of a loner, but I can remember coming home from school, going and doing chores, and I'd just tell mom, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go sleep on the mountain tonight. And so I'd throw my sleeping bag in my backpack, and I'd go up on the mountain. And she just said, as long as you're home to do chores in the morning, that's fine. So I just, I was always doing stuff like that. I like to be alone. I don't know if it was childhood depression or, <laughs> or what, but I think I just kind of had that in my nature. And, uh, you know, it just kind of has grown as I've grown up, the adventures have gotten a little bit more advanced and a little more extreme. And then, 
it just is what it is, you know. To this day, I, I still love to hunt with people and love to hunt with my brother and whoever else. But even even when I do, I find that I go one way and they go the other way, you know. But, do you find that you actually hunt differently when you're hunting by yourself versus uh, when you're hunting with someone else? Or is, is it pretty much the same? I'm a way better hunter personally when I'm by myself than I am when I'm with somebody else. Um, my brother and I, we're kind of the same where neither one of us want to be selfish. So it's always we're trying to set the other guy up on the, the stock. Yeah on the elk or something and so it's and then you know you get too casual sometimes when you're hunting with with buddies so i i think when i'm by myself i'm a lot more effective i'm definitely a lot better cameraman when i'm by myself but oh, really um, <laughs> yeah because i focus on it when i go with boyd or my you know my brother or my buddies it's like we're just chit chat we're just hanging out hunting and i'm not really focusing on the on the filming part of it so i feel like i do a lot better by myself but Maybe it's because I get this thing where, you know, hey, what's around the next corner? What's what's over there? And I start hiking, and, and pretty soon you're six miles away from the truck versus, you know, if you're hunting with someone else, you're like, oh, I don't know if they'd want to walk down there, if they'd want to do this, or they'd want to do that. And so I'm kind of the same way, you know. I try well, to worry about everybody else too much. Honestly, yeah, when I when I hunt with Boyd, Boyd's my brother, so if I refer to him as Boyd, it's just Boyd. I'm not going to keep saying my brother, but because we hunt the most out of any anybody that I hunt with. But, like... When I'm hunting with him, we just go 100 miles an hour. It's as fast as we can go, and we cover a lot of ground. I find that when I'm hunting by myself, I don't know if it's uh, passiveness or just taking in the surroundings a lot more, but I hunt a lot more slowly. I actually cover less ground than I do when I'm with my brother or anybody else. And I think in a lot of ways that helps me to be a little bit more patient. And, of course, the cameras have the ability to – or have the effect of just slowing everything and pulling it all back. Because I can't just push hard or, or rarely push hard. I have to kind of take it all in. And that's made, made the hunting side of it pretty effective. You know? So is, uh, as hunting solo, does the cam- being the cameraman and the hunter, is that kind of a love-hate relationship a lot of the times? Because I know how hard it is to be a cameraman. I can't imagine being a cameraman and hunting and everything else. It used to be, um, used to be really frustrating. And it still gets frustrating, but I really do enjoy the cameras. I mean... I tell people all the time when I when I do interviews or whatever is it's like it's not all about the hunting for me. It's it's the entire package. It's everything that I've built around my business of the TV show and the product and everything else. The cameras are a big huge part of that. And without that, I feel like when I just go on a hunt and and just hunt and don't don't mess around with the cameras, I end up not enjoying myself nearly as much. And I did it this year. I went on a hunt and uh, it'll actually air as one of the episodes, but I basically filmed nothing all day long, got down, came on a bull elk, you know, and then I'm just like, crap, I can get this sucker killed. Within 10 minutes, the elk was dead. And I'm like, well, wow, I didn't have anything to show for that. Yeah, that was a great, a great successful hunt, but I felt kind of disappointed at myself that I didn't document the entire day. You know, all I had was just that, that one little piece. Yeah, so hindsight, it's, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and, you know, you're, you're doing things and you're like, oh, man, I should have filmed that, but you don't realize it till after everything happens. Yeah, so I just find that I film as I go because then I get back, and obviously with the TV show, it's like if, if you have all of that content, you can use it in another episode or you can use it in highlight videos or the intro. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a lot of elements to the show and to different videos that I produce that is content that was that came from an unsuccessful hunt because, you know, a quarter of my hunts are unsuccessful. So I've got all that footage to, to use somewhere. So we see you doing a lot of rifle hunting, um, and obviously with the show, it's probably tough to do a lot of bow hunting, and we've seen Remy try to do it. I've seen you try to do it with the, using the bow and the camera. Um, what's your preference? Do you like to rifle hunt over bow hunt, or is that just kind of for the show, or what's your preference on uh, hunting styles? I prefer to bow hunt, and actually I bow hunt three times, you know, eight to, eight to ten out of I, – eight to ten of my hunts are bow hunting. It's just that – not all of them are successful. It's a lot easier to be successful with a rifle. So I bow hunt way more than I do with the rifle. But I love them both just as equally because they're different times of the year, different different seasons. You know, everything is different. The animals act differently. And so just because you have a rifle in your hand doesn't necessarily mean it's just as easy to kill that deer because rifle hunts are generally during October. October sucks to hunt deer, yeah. you know. Whereas August – November and December are awesome to hunt deer. So, you know, it's it's all relative to the to the species and to the time of year, in my opinion. But I, I love it all. I mean, a little trigger therapy is pretty sweet sometimes. Well, I've heard that success can be boiled down to 
part strategy and and i guess part mindset um being a solo hunter is there's a lot of things weighing on you and there's a lot of different things going on during that hunt to you know keep your head in the game uh how much of that how much of your success do you weigh towards the mindset and how much towards just strategy and tactics um i i don't think anything could compensate for time in the field you know i mean that's one thing that uh you know, guides or outfitters or call them TV people or whatever. The only thing that I have different on a lot of guys is time is the ability to spend time in the field. I can spend more more days in the field than a lot of people can because of what I do for work or for my for my job. And I don't hunt the weekends, you know, so I'm hunting Monday through Friday. So I've got the whole week where no one everybody else is at work and then on the weekends they roll in. And so I attribute just just time in the field to the number one as far as success goes on, on killing. And then, you know, just experience. I mean, shoot, I'm getting older and older every every year, and I've been hunting, basically taught ourselves to hunt, my brothers and I, from the time we were 12 on up. And when you teach yourselves something over a 20, 30-year process, you're going to learn it. Uh, you're going to learn, get pick it up pretty good. I mean, you're going to get pretty efficient at it. Do you think uh, with solo hunting, do you think being, you know, in the wilderness or wherever you're at, um, whether New Zealand wilderness, um, being in the being in, being out there for like 10 straight days, um, does that wear on you being a solo hunter with with uh, the motivation and everything or the drive uh, more than, say, when you have someone with you to kind of, you know, bounce ideas off of and and not get burnt out, so to speak? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think it can go either way. Uh, I think... I've been on hunts. You may have been on hunts. Some of these other guys listening may have been on hunts with other people, and those other people aren't mentally with it, and they're ready to go. And all of a sudden, that bleeds over into your mentality, and, and next thing you know, you're both heading for the truck three days three days early. Um, when I'm by myself, if I'm if I'm that mentally strong guy, if I'm the guy that says, you know, I'm on this mountain for ten days, no matter what, you know, hell or high water, I'm going to kill something or I'm going to run out of food. If I have that mental game, then there's nobody to bring me down. But when you are by yourself, it's hard to keep that uh, level for long periods of time. And experienced it several times this year. You know, this year was a, a tough year for me. It was a great year as far as hunting goes, but with work and the amount of things going on and, and just all the busyness of life, I mean, I was unhealthy. I was out of shape. I was grumpy, not, not <laughs> depressed, but just... My mind was not into hunting this year, and you'll see that on episodes that, you know, I'm 15 pounds heavier than I am now all through hunting season when I was hunting, and just, I just got ill because I was not, just not my best self. And that's when it's easy to just go on a couple of hunts. I mean, I drove 12 hours up to cent- north central Idaho, and I was going to be there for the week. I was there for two days and turned around and came home, you know, because my mind just was not with it. So did you, just, kick, you, did you just kick not, yourself once you got home and man, I should have stayed out there longer, or, or are you uh, committed to your decisions? Now when I think back at it, you know, look back at it and kind of laugh. Yeah, I kicked myself at it, but at the time, man, I mean, when you're not feeling well, you just nothing matters, you know. And I don't know what it was. I don't know what to attribute it to, other than I was fat, out of shape, super stressed and busy. And, you know, with young kids and, and young wife at home, it, it just, I just didn't want to be out there this fall. So how much is uh, conditioning going to play into next year's haunting season? And, and uh, when's that start? It's playing a big role. You know, the older I get, the more I realize that um, I can't just eat like a pit eat like a pig and work out like a horse anymore. <laughs> I got to really dial things in. And, you know, I've, I've made a, a lot of lifestyle changes since about November, you know, on my eating and workout regimen. And I'm never going to be, be that guy that just hammers home, you know, work out every day, run every day, eat right and everything. It's like, no, do, do what you, whatever you want to do. For me, I'm choosing now to eat healthy, to exercise, to, you know, take the right things into my body, to be the best person that I can. Because I just experienced three months of hell. September, October, November, December, I guess that's September, October, November, four months of hell where I didn't want to be on the mountain and I never want to feel that way ever again. But that's what I experienced this fall. And so that was a life changing event for me. And maybe it's my midlife crisis at this <laughs> stage. I'm not that old, but it's like something hit me 
that I had to make a change. And I never want to go back to that place. And that's me personally. Other people, I don't care what they do. Just whatever you do, do whatever you, I mean, do what you want to do. I mean, don't do something because you think that that's the way to do it. But, um, you know, for me, that's what's going on right now. So I guess you could say I've kind of jumped into the, the train to hunt, you know, mountain warrior mentality. No, that's good. And, uh, you know, everyone's kind of driving their own agendas. And like you said, it's whatever gets you fit. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're a runner, great. If you're a lifter, great. But at the end of the day, you just don't want to be sucking wind on the side of a mountain and hating life or want to go home or anything like that. I'm never going to be Remy Warren on the mountain. <laughs> I don't never. think anyone is. Those guys, you know, they're just super, super fit individuals. And, you know, I'm going to get as fit as I pers- as I possibly can. And that's going to make me enjoy it better. Am I going to be a better hunter for it? I don't think my skills are going to get any better, but I think I'm going to be a lot more efficient at, at you know, carrying out those skills um and that's just the fact of it because you've you've seen the you've seen the places where we hunt it's not it's not flat land i mean it's big country so i see you're wearing the mountain ops yeah you, uh, you've been trying out that mountain op stuff or what do you think of it yeah so um mountain ops it was a, it was about uh october october november when i first started uh working with those guys and that was a major part of uh part of my decision to change was the fact that when I did begin a regimen, a health regimen, I call it, and change my diet and change the supplements that I was taking and everything, something about Mountain Ops just clicked for me, you know, and it, it might not just click for the other guy, but whatever, whatever is in their products and whatever, whatever formulas they have, it just worked for me and worked for my body. And I immediately started to feel a difference in it. And it took me out of that dark place. And I attribute a lot of that to Mountain Ops. Not just their products, but also the, the people behind it. I mean, those guys really, um, we really struck a great relationship and have established something way beyond any sponsorship or way beyond what people from the outside looking in can see. We've struck a, a, a strong friendship and partnership between Solo Hunter and Mountain Ops, and that's just continued to grow. So I'm going to support them for as long as they're going to support me, and we're, we're in it for the long run. And it's because I can honestly look back and say, I believe in the company and in the product and in the people behind it. Are there a lot of other supplements and different products on the market that could do the exact same thing? Probably, but you're not always going to have that personal relationship and you're not going to have certain things with it. And I love the brand, you know, so I'm going to, going to keep, keep pushing forward with it. No, that, yeah, that's great. And, uh, there's something to be said for those guys being in the hunting community itself, and, and uh, it's good to see that everybody really likes those guys. But I think you need to make a deal with those guys and that Remy can't have that stuff. I think he's, uh, he's good enough as it is. <laughs> yeah, you know what? it's kind of funny. Um, I had been using another product uh, off and on in the past, and Remy's actually one of the spokespeople for another product. And for Wilderness Athlete, hell, I'll say it. There's yeah. nothing – no secrets there, but he helps with some of their, you know, some of their product development and writing and everything. And that's great. There's plenty of room in this industry for, you know, wilderness athlete, mountain ops. And I guarantee there's going to be two or three others trickling in because the hunting industry is growing, you know, and that's the beauty of mountain ops is we're not just limiting ourselves to the hunting industry. Mountain Ops is a lifestyle brand and a lifestyle product that we are getting out to the masses. You know, this is something that we're looking beyond the hunting industry. We're not so narrow minded that it's just all about us, you know, being big, bad hunters and we just want to hunt all the time. You take hunting out of my life. I'm a happy man. You put hunting back in and I'm a happy man. I mean, it, to me, it really it's just a part of living life. Life is the journey. Hunting is part of it. If hunting wasn't there, I'd be replacing my time with fishing. You know, or something else. So. Yeah. No, it's good to see. Um, so let's kind of get back on topic here. We got off on a tangent, but uh, when it comes to selecting areas, as far as a new hunting area, when you're looking at it from the solo perspective, how does that change when you're looking at it in any other way, um, or does it, or how do you select areas, or how do you go about finding a new area? Sure. The only, I'll just to touch on the solo point. The only thing that changes that would be different from a solo hunt versus a hunt with a group of buddies or whatever is um, I have to really take a close look at my ability to pack an animal off the mountain, you know, especially an elk hunt or something big like that. I'm not going to do a 10, 12 mile back in country hunt by myself 
and kill an elk back there unless I know for sure I can either get horses or get a buddies to get in there and get it out, you know, or, or something just because the physical limitations. So that's the only thing that changes. Everything else is the first thing that I do when I, you know, I'm either re- researching an area or let's just start with when I have a tag. So I draw a tag in a certain unit. I'll spend hours and hours and hours on Google Earth just researching, just looking at the topography and the landscape, you know, just taking a look at springs and different areas where, where it might hold animals. And so the majority of my scouting is done on the computer because most of the areas that I hunt are, you know, 10, 12, 14 hour truck drive away. So as much as you can do on Google Earth, the best, in my opinion. So how do you use Google Earth to, uh, to do all your scouting? Are you just flying through or, you know, how do you, how do you scan on Google Earth? I have a whole, I mean, I go through it and I have everything marked, different places I've been. If I do any scouting, everything is marked. Saw Big Buck here, you know, at this time of day. I marked the wind, direction, all that kind of stuff, moon phase. So it's all, I learned all of that basically from hunting whitetails for several years. When I moved to the Midwest and got just enamored with hunting whitetails, I learned to document wind direction, moon phase, um, time of day time of year all those different aspects when i see a specific animal or something because that buck is in that place for a reason he's not this he's not just strolling through big big deer don't do that they live in this area and they've got a plan for everything and so i write that down and try to put that piece of the puzzle together because the more that i did that the more i realized that it's it's very very similar in every area that you hunt the animals act the same way they do the same things um, it's just that the terrain is a little bit different. So if you can key in on those aspects of it, it's not something that you have to rehash and redevelop every hunt that you go on. You just have to remind yourself of all of those elements so that when you do go to that area, you know that specific times of the day, you know, specific wind directions, all this kind of thing. This is how the deer is going to lay. This is what they're going to do pr- predominantly. And you kind of formulate your plan from there. I mean, there's always variables, but there's there's a lot of things that are pretty much down the line as well what about as far as units or say you're going to a new state say you want to hunt a new area in wyoming as far as is your research going into like selecting an area that way sure um a lot of i do my brother boyd he's been really good at researching areas but um as of late in the last uh, little while i've got with a guy um his name's riley warwood down in, in utah he he owns the bow shop and he's getting the groundwork laid to start a um, application service and everything. And so I don't, I don't personally enjoy research on that part of it. You know, I don't enjoy saying, okay, I'm going to go hunt Wyoming. I'm going to look and find the best areas. I hate that. It's not my thing. All I want to do is have somebody figure that out, whether it's Boyd or whether it's Riley and say, this is where you should hunt in Wyoming. Then I want to draw the tag and then I want to go to work because I don't excel in the research. My time is spent doing a lot of other things to, put food on the table. I don't have time to spend just in front of the computer for fun researching where to put in a tag. When other people already have that knowledge, I'm going to those people and I'm going to use their knowledge. No, that's good. Yeah. I mean, you can waste a lot of time looking looking and researching units. Some uh, guys enjoy the heck out of it, man. Boyd eats it up. I mean, he knows everything there is to know about every state. My good friend, Brian Solon, they know everything there is to know about every state. I don't know it and I don't want to know it. I don't care. It's it's. <laughs> I have enough room in my little pea brain to uh, to catalog all of that stuff. So I go to Riley and Boyd; they know all that information, and I use it. Remy's really good resource too. So, so how many how many hunts a year are you doing right now, or or about, and uh, how many days in the field are you spending? So I personally am only doing six to eight hunts a year. So that's you know 50, 50 days hunting, 40, 50 days hunting, um, because I'm doing half the episodes, and Remy does half the episodes. Um, as his new show launches actually next week, April 6th, his new show apex predator is launching and we're super stoked about that. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. I mean, we hope that we can keep everything exactly like it is, but we're, we're all big boys here and we realize that things change and careers, you know, change. So we just don't know what to expect. Um, hopefully everything goes great for everybody. You know, well, you've created quite a community with a solo hunter. How did that come about? And, uh, and how did that all get going? So um, I was doing working with another TV show um, in the early 2000s, whitetail type of show. And when I got out of that, I was still filming hunts. You know, that's kind of what got me into to the TV side of it. But 
basically I was just filming hunts and I, I hunted alone. And so it just was natural to just film it alone. And I, I, after leaving that TV show, I, I told myself, I'm like, you know what? At some point in time when I can get some money behind me or figure something out, I'm going to start my show and it's going to be all about solo hunting, hunting by yourself. And at the time I didn't have a name for it, but it was like, it's going to be guys that just hunt by themselves, you know? And that, of course I'm young and I'm a kid and I'm thinking it's going to be all me. I'm just going to be hunting by myself. It's going to be my show. Blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of the idea kind of came then, but a lot of things had to fall into place and a lot of things had to happen in order for that to, to, to happen. So it was just kind of a, a fortune, you know, something bad happened to somebody else, something good happened to me. You know, it's just kind of the way things work. Where I was producing a show, I'll just tell you the quick condensed version of the story. I was producing a show for some guys out of Missouri on Sportsman Channel. And through the third and fourth quarter, so that's July through Christmas time. And they ran out of funding about right at the tail end of the third quarter. So I was carrying the contract with Sportsman Channel. Sportsman Channel said, no problem, we'll cut your contract down. But we got to continue to run their shows for the rest of the year. And I was like, bull crap. If I'm paying for the network, this is my chance. I've got five episodes in the can of self-filmed hunts. I'm going to run my show. And they said, well, if you can get us a pilot here and prove that the show is worthy, then we'll go ahead and do it. And I sent them a pilot episode. I cut together one of my solo hunts. And uh, actually, they had the episode on a Tuesday and it went to air on Thursday. Wow. And from then, the network was like, holy crap, this is awesome. And sponsors, you know, and we're, Pete Company started calling. And then I got on the phone calling everybody I knew begging for money because I was, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in the hole to the network for it because I wasn't ready for it. And I, you know, I'm not a rich man. I didn't have any backing. So it was like, if I'm on the hook for thirty grand anyway, I'm not running somebody else's stuff. I'm running my stuff. And so that was the risk that I took. That was the moment of decision where decisions determine destiny. And if I had made the decision to just fold up and either file bankruptcy or just air their shows, Solo Hunter probably would have never happened because that opportunity just, it was just there. And I'm glad that I made the decision I made. And yeah, it took me a year to, to dig out of that hole, but because of the uniqueness of Solo Hunter and because of, that's all I had, you know, I mean, I put everything that I have emotionally and everything into it and uh, there was no plan B. I mean... It was either succeed and become a TV show and become a business. I mean, it's more than just a TV show, but it had to be something that paid the bills and provided a living and ultimately down the road could accumulate wealth. I mean, that's, that's, that's what a business model is. Yeah. You know, you take those stages and that's how I approached it was as a business. No, that's awesome. And it turned out really well. And, and congrats on all that. I mean, it, it's a great show and it's a great, it's more than that. Like you said, it's a, it's a community and you've, You've created a quite a community of guys that are out there filming their stuff and, and you know, a whole new whole new avenue in the hunting industry. The coolest part about it is the guys that are involved the, the are you know, are, are supporters of it like yourself. You guys are all the hardest hunters in the industry. I mean the the best hunters in the country are not on TV. The best hunters in the country are the guides, the outfitters, guys that you would that aren't even on social media, you know. Those guys are hardcore. And yet that's what I'm finding. Those are the guys that are watching Solo Hunter and Meat Eater and shows like ours because that's the way they hunt and that's the way they do it. And so we're kind of – I feel like we're relating to the truest core of a true hunter, you know, that, that hunts the way I grew up hunting and the way that I, I think hunting should be where it's, you know, everything's fair for everybody, public land, you know, everything. Absolutely, and I, I think it's changing the industry. But what do you think the, the future of the industry in that aspect is going to look like? And how is is this type of show and you know re, what Remy's doing now and and what Stephen Rinell is doing? How is that changing the industry? Do you think? Um, definitely changing for the better. Inter I mean, it's 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 becoming less of just a hunting industry and more of an entertainment industry on the TV side of it. Um, Everything continues to grow, but there's so much good talent out there, guys that are great producers, uh, video talent. You're finding people now that they're going into the hunting industry on the production side of it as a career rather than just, you know, ah, flooring's not doing good for me anymore. I'm sick of hanging drywall. I'm going to go produce a TV show and do it in my garage. Well, you used to be able to do that. You can't do that anymore because the networks have changed, advertisers have changed, and the game has changed and reached a certain level to where – even for me, I'm nervous about keeping up my production quality, you know, and keeping it up to a certain level. But I think society as a whole um, likes 
the rogue, the outdoor lifestyle. I think that they're just now starting to realize that hunting is a part of that. And that's why you're seeing such a movement outside of just the hunting, you know, world is quote unquote mainstream or people outside of it that are, that are outdoors people and survivalists and naturalists and everything else. I think they're slowly coming to a realization that hunting is all part of that. And so it's becoming more and more acceptable. And you can thank networks like Discovery Channel and A&E and all those for bringing in those Alaskan shows and the survival shows and the bush people and the, you know, and and actually interjecting a hunting element into it, even though they don't do it in a way I feel is, is real, at least they're interjecting that. And, and so now people are starting to get an appetite for that hunting culture. That's making our, our broadcast industry grow, you know, the hunting broadcast industry grow. Yeah. And like you said, as, as that happens, the barrier to entry goes up a little bit, but I do think you see a lot of people doing some really awesome stuff, you know, with the private film side. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what kind of gear you're running as far as camera equipment and, uh, and, and what you prefer as a solo hunter. Sweet. I'll just grab it. I got it right here. Pretty much. I run a DSLR personally. Um, I like it because I can switch out my lenses and do a lot of things artistically. I don't recommend it. I mean, I recommend just a regular handy cam or something small. That's uh, basically a, mm-hmm. you know, real automated and then a GoPro. So basically this is my camera setup right here. You know, yeah. you're talking $900 camera body with probably three or four lenses and then $500 GoPro, you know, I mean, that's really all I use to do any of my hunts is that right there. Remy uses, he was using a DSLR sometimes, but he also uses the Handycam. Um, the four, it's a Panasonic 4K Handycam. I can't remember what it's called now. How but many different lenses are you packing with you on that? I'll pack three or four. It just depends on the hunt, you know, and, and what I'm doing. So I'll either, you know, it just depends, but there's, there's always at least three that go with me every time just for different situations. And what's your, what's your audio look like? Uh, Sennheiser wireless. Sennheiser. I was, I was using a boom a lot, but, um, as I started to get later into the season from, from last year, the boom works great until the, the wind really picks up and it knocks a lot, but just, I'm just getting a lot better audio quality with the wireless mics. So it's just, uh, just, I just patch it right into the camera. I mean, my editing style and everything, these cameras have pretty good audio, audio, uh, condensers or whatever the heck they call them in there it's it's still not what you would consider pro level audio but the general listener watching tv cannot tell the difference you know it's not until you get into a studio and get your headphones that you can actually tell really the difference between audio going through this camera or my gopro for that matter and audio going through one of the high-end broadcast cameras i mean there is a difference but it's not not noticeable on tv i don't think as far as the guys breaking into this and, and trying to film their own hunts and whatnot, do you think the GoPro is something that's good enough, or, or what's your recommendation on uh, entry-level style cameras? So I have, just kind of let it out, is I've filmed an entire episode only with a GoPro. Really? Because I'm that confident in the video quality and with what I can do with the GoPro. Granted, I've, I've spent, you know, I've been using those things for five years, four, four years, ever since they came out. I've, just still, I've still got a Hero original somewhere. Um, but the hero four, I mean, you've got 4k video quality. It's just in the right situations, right lighting and everything. I'm, I'm hundred percent confident in what they can turn out, you know? Now I saw a pretty nice video of you, uh, going through your gear before a hunt, but why don't you talk about, uh, your gear preparation and, and kind of, I know you're, you're meticulous about that and you, you got a good system there. What's, uh, what's your gear preparation before a hunt say like, I mean, you did the one for New Zealand, but I guess any hunt would work. Pretty much once I have that have it all set for the first of the season, I'll, I mean, I, it doesn't change. So I'll have my bag. And you guys have seen me use a lot of different bags over the years. Um, you know, now and that's what's kind of crazy with equipment is what I'm using right now or what I use this fall um, might not necessarily – or what I'm using now might not necessarily be what I used on the hunts this last fall. And so it's, it's hard because a lot of the new sponsor's equipment doesn't get it in the show until a whole year later. But basically – you know, I just line out what I need for early season, and then as the se- as the season progresses, that just changes. You know, it goes from lightweight sleeping bag and maybe a bivy to a little heavier sleeping bag and a tent, or you know, just along those lines. But it's just your equipment has to change to the seasons and to the to the areas and what you're doing. 
So what, I mean, your, what did your equipment look like back in the old days, back before you were a famous TV star? What was, uh, <laughs> what was what, the old days look like? So I was shooting a Polaris, ex, not even Express, an old Polaris, PSE Polaris bow until 2003. Wow. So you're talking t- not that long ago that in 2003 I got, or 2004, I got my first uh, Matthews bow. And I think it was, what was it? was the Outback or something like that. Outback. Maybe that was the Outback in 2004, 2005. But up until then, it was the same bow that I bought when I was 13 years old. That PSE. Wow, uh, really? Like, so that's the same bow for how many years? I used it from the time I was 13 until, shoot, in 2004. I don't even want to say how old I was. What is that? 18, 25, 26-ish? Wow. Well, I used that, that thing. That bow could tell some stories. I'm sure it has some good ones. Yeah, fortunate. You know, unfortunately, it only killed one animal. So, you know, I mean, basically, it's like when I when we started because we didn't have mentors. I didn't really kill anything with my bow until shoot my twenties. I mean, I, I shot an elk the very first year when I was thirteen and didn't recover it. And from then on, I didn't kill anything with my bow until my mid twenties, mid late twenties. You just hunting with your rifle back then? Well, I mean, I was bow hunting like crazy, but I just wasn't any good at it. You know, I mean, because. <laughs> When you're, this is like if anybody, if anybody tried to just go play and they've never, nobody's showing them how to do it and they're just trying to figure it out, good freaking luck, man. And that's kind of how it was with my brothers and I for hunting. It's like, it took a, it took a long process to figure it out. And uh, I, I liked it. I'm glad that it worked out that way because I feel like everything that I've learned and accomplished has been from a lot of hard work and a lot of uh, a lot of trial and error, a lot more error than, than anything. But well, if you could go back and tell that twenty year old self, you know, <clears throat> one tactic or one thing to make him more successful, what would that be? Find a dang mentor. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Just uh, yeah, I don't know. Just what, keep doing that. I mean, well, what's your what's what would you consider your your best skill or best attribute attribute uh, when it comes to hunting that makes you successful? I mean, some of us are patient. I am not one of those. Um, some of us can cover a lot of ground. I don't know. There's just different skills. What would you consider the skill that makes you successful? I don't feel like I'm that great of a hunter. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of. I mean, I yeah. I don't know. I think it's just. I don't think that it's because hunting is um, a sport for me or an extracurricular activity. This is, it's been a part of my life for such a long amount of time that it's, it's just a part of living. It's just a part of doing. You just, you just go up on the mountain, you find an animal, put him in a position where you can kill him and then you kill him. I mean, I don't know. I think it just comes from, from doing it. And from learning that animal so well and the conditions so well that you can figure things out. It's just, I don't, I don't really know that there is any magic trick. It's just figuring it out. You just got to figure out what the heck that animal is going to do or what you think he's going to do and uh, figure out what the winds are going to do, the thermals or any of that. It's, it's all just comes from education in the field. You can't teach somebody those things without them spending time doing it, I don't think. Yeah. Well, uh, why don't you give us a couple pieces of gear that, uh, that you always have with you? Or what's, your, what's your two pieces of gear that are a must-have for you? I mean, besides your bow and your camera. Um, survival medic, always with me. Survival kit. I mean, obviously, you're by yourself. And it's more than just a first aid kit, so I've got some survival gear with it. Um, signaling, fire starting, moderate shelter, all those types of things. Three forms to start a fire. I mean, you never know when you're going to need a fire, all those that. Um, satellite phone goes with me everywhere. I have three young kids and my wife and I like to talk to them every day. And so I call them every day. Um, and that's just part of what I choose to do. So I would say those are really the main, main elements. Um, what sat phone are you running? I've got the spot sat phone. Now I've got an Iridium 755, 7585 or whatever that is, uh, 9555 Iridium. And then I've been using this, I used the spot last year quite a bit and it worked really well. But if I go international or something, I use the Iridium. We uh, we did a hunt up in Alaska in 2012 and, and rented a sat phone uh, mm-hmm. from someone up there. And 
um, the guy that was with me, he had a, his anniversary was on the 15th of September. So we kind of pre-planned that he had to call in on his anniversary at least. And uh, mind you, then we had to call in for a float plane. And so the, the 15th comes and our cell phone or our, our satellite phone wasn't activated. And so not only did he not get to call on his anniversary, so I'm sure she was panic mode, but then we didn't even have a way to call into the plane. So we sat yeah. there for two days in a thunderstorm waiting on a plane. We didn't know if it was coming or not, and they didn't know where we were. So, yeah, set phones are a touchy subject, and they're a, they're a must-have but also must-work. Yeah, and you've got to have a backup or something like that when you, in a case like that. I mean, I got into a situation last year on one of the shows where my sat phone didn't work, and it you know, it came down to uh, something like that. I didn't. I renewed it up, and but it was like the day after, a couple of days after the renewal or something that it didn't work. And I came off the mountain. I mean, I went four miles back down to the truck and drove another thirty miles until I got phone service to call my wife. And uh, just because it, I know her, and if I hadn't, we didn't have a pre-plan set up because my phone's always worked, you know. And so, um, if I hadn't, it would have got pretty ugly, pretty expensive. <laughs> Yeah, you got a happy wife, happy life, right? You got to got to keep her happy so you can go hunting. So yeah, you got any uh, big hunts coming up uh, this spring, or what do you got planned this spring? <sighs> Nothing this spring. I was gonna do um, a hunt, but I'm not now. I've just got too much work going on. There's uh, some new things coming up that uh, are gonna start taking some more of my time, and so I'm not gonna do a hunt this spring. Even though right now I think we're sitting at 11 episodes, so we've got to come up with two more episodes somehow for the show for this fall but um i'll figure that out as i get closer <laughs> but it's just all it's all next week's vacation for me with my family in, in yosemite and then it's all back to work and hammering it so well uh why don't you tell us a little bit about what else you got going on over at solo hunter and uh where guys can check out a little bit more about solo hunter or check out some of the shows and stuff all right cool so um a lot of new things coming down the pipe. I'm not in the position to make a lot of announcements yet as far as that goes. The biggest things are Remy's show launching next week, April 6th on Sportsman Channel, Apex Predator. Check that out. Um, Solo Hunter TV on all your social medias. So it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Facebook is going to pot. So Instagram is where I'm at mostly and Twitter. And they're all at Solo Hunter TV. And then... Um, going to see some changes with the product line that we're carrying and the website and maybe the logo and uh you know that's about it with solo hunter so i saw you guys uh pumped out some shirts and i didn't even get one they went so fast <laughs> um are you guys gonna be doing some more of that stuff or no yeah so i put those on sale just to get rid of them because i thought it was going to take a few weeks and it literally took three hours and cleaned me out of you know 100 and something shirts that i had and, and hats i still have a few of the hats left but we're totally redesigning all new apparel new logo new website um got a bunch of new products that i'm coming out with this fall as well as some products we're licensing so um a lot of really really cool things with solo hunter as we we continue to grow the brand and evolve it a little bit um in certain directions and then um a couple more tv projects you know so last year i did off grid that kind of that was fun and everything but i didn't have a lot of time to it so now i'm focusing on uh, solo hunter and one or two others and we'll see what happens we'll see what comes down the pipe well nice uh we'll leave links in the show notes as well and, and on the website to all the projects cool. you're working on and and hopefully you get some more apparel pop back up here pretty soon or, or at least in the near future um, so I got it. We're going to do a Skype call tomorrow. Oh, they've been texting the heck out of me, the guys that are designing the shirt. So we're going to do a Skype call tomorrow. Hopefully we can go over a bunch of that stuff. And just um, I wish I could let everything out of what's going on, but there's just so much in the works um, It's that's exciting. And uh, I just I just can't wait for it all to happen. You know, so. All right. Well, you have to keep us posted. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll keep the website up to date on what you're working on and, and hopefully catch up with you on Twitter and Instagram and probably not Facebook. Yeah, right? I'm stoked to have another good podcast to follow, man. I've gotten into podcasts quite a bit lately. So oh, have stoked. You? Yeah. There's not a whole lot of hunting ones. So we're, we're happy to kind of put it together. Good, good. <laughs> well, already, Tim, it was good talking with you. You too, man. Appreciate it. Hey guys, thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show and maybe even picked up a few tips along the way. Join us right here every Thursday morning for more interviews and great hunting tips. 
And be sure to help us out by leaving a review on iTunes. For more information about this show and the rest of our guests, check out the show notes for links and additional resources on our website, www.therichoutdoors.net.